It is my honor to introduce Dr. Azim Salim, a distinguished medical professional and a visionary in the field of clinical oncology and molecular imaging. Dr. Salim, medical journey began in Chennai with a MBBS and a diploma in radiotherapy. In 1993, he moved to UK where he embarked a remarkable path of specialization and innovation. He earned his PhD from the prestigious Imperial College London, focusing on PET molecular imaging in anti-cancer drug development. He also obtained his fellowship from Royal College of Radiologists. Dr. Salim's professional career is equally impressive, including honorary consultant in clinical oncology at Christ Hospital in Manchester, head of oncology at Glasgow Smith Clinical Imaging Center based in Hammersmith Hospital, London, head of oncology and respiratory medicine at Imanova, a groundbreaking joint venture between Imperial College, University College, London, and King's College. In 2019, Dr. Salim returned to academia as a reader and a honorary consultant in clinical oncology at Hull York Medical School. Dr. Salim is currently a clinical director of Hull Molecular Imaging Centers. Dr. Salim's dedication to advancing medicine, medical science and improving patient's care is truly inspiring. Welcome you, doctor. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Our next guest is Dr. Salim Ajmal. I take immense pleasure in introducing Dr. Salim Ajmal. Dr. Ajmal is a highly accomplished medical professional with a rich and diverse career. A graduate of medical, Madras Medical College, he completed postgraduate training in Kastubara Medical College and specialized in urology at University College London. Later, he achieved you need membership to move of slide. Royal... You're still at my slide. You need to move to a slide. Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you. Um, Later, he achieved um, membership of Royal College of General Practice. Currently, Dr. Ajmal is a senior partner and a GP at Littlebury Medical Center, a renowned training practice in Holbridge. He has also served as a clinical director of the South Lincoln Rural PSEN and is an active member of Lincolnshire Local Medical Committee. In addition to his medical expertise, Dr. Ajmal is deeply involved in community welfare. He is a trustee of Grantham Muslim Community Association, chairman of Aylford Islamic Center, and he is very closely associated to UKTM. As an advisory member to the committee, he plays a key role in shaping and advancing the vision of UKTM. We are proud, we are also very proud to acknowledge Dr. Ajmal is the spouse of our esteemed UKTM Vice Chan Chan Chairman, Mrs. Sherin Ajmal. Together, they contribute significantly to the growth and the mission of our organization. Dr. Ajmal's commitment to the healthcare community service and his advisory role within UKTM make him an invaluable member to our family. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Ajmal and Dr. Salim. Welcome you doctors, please take this stage. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Asif, uh, for the lovely introduction for both of us. I would like to thank all the people who have joined us today on this cancer screening program. Cancer always remains one of the leading causes of illness and death globally. Um, however, early detection through effective screening has the potential to save countless lives. I'm not sure how many people know Tamil, but we are quite happy to encourage if the, someone wants to speak in Tamil, because I think so this program is recorded. I feel uh, I will keep myself to English, but of course uh, we are all from Chennai. Uh, despite the cancer screening being free and widely available in the UK through the NHS, many people do not participate in it. So I just want to highlight some of the factors why they're not participating and why we are conducting the screening program especially for our community. I think so the first is most important is because we all come from uh, India, it's lack of awareness and knowledge. We are not sure whether they are qualified for the screening or whether they receive the invitation letters. Some people may 
not fully understand the importance of the screening <clears throat> and they mistake that this is only for people with symptoms some people may think that oh namage edavadu vali varunda edavadu problem irundha tha idu pannuma thavara but this is definitely it's for everyone i think so dr uh, azim i mean uh, he will be explaining more about it and uh, because we are coming from india sometimes it's very difficult for us to understand the medical terms or the screening process and sometimes that may be some confusion as well other factors which the people don't use or come forward for the screening program is mainly for fear of receiving a cancer diagnosis but what they don't understand is the earlier the diagnosis the better it is for them also some people have got some misjudgment about the pain or discomfort including the embarrassment during the test especially for mammogram cervical screen or for prostate including my own colleagues they all feel embarrassed how do how do you go about it some people might have had some past i mean negative experience with the hospitals and that is also my discourage participation especially because we are all coming from chennai sometimes we do have social and cultural barriers for not doing this test sometimes talking about the cancer or undergoing screenings for intimate areas like cervical prostate it may consider taboo in some cultures especially because we are all tamil speaking we might be able to difficult to understand the invitation letters that's the reason why we want to make sure and aware of our tamil community some people may have mistrust in the healthcare systems and reluctance to participate in this process other thing which i want to mention was about our work commitments we, all of us are very busy i mean we have child care responsibilities and then we fail to attend the appointments sometimes there might be lack of transportation or mobility issues especially in rural areas sometimes we might even overlook the latter because normally this these are all national screening programs and usually comes by post and that is why it is very important for you to go back and register with your gp especially i'm a gp to register your current address and details with the gp so that you do not miss any of these invitations i also want to specifically stress about the attitude of the people people always say that oh it won't happen to me and especially when they feel healthy and have no family history of cancer so it's very very important why we are doing this some people are very reluctant in saying that oh i don't want to do any medical tests they want to wait until something is wrong with me but that is completely wrong and some people even doubt the accuracy of the screening procedure and sometimes it can be in, i mean like we have our own factors as well for example in our health uh, uh, there might be some inconvenient appointment times or there might be some uh, experience in delays or sometimes the people would have already had it done before and they have some discomfort or negative experiences for which they don't go ahead with the screening program the covid also had a huge impact on this so what i'm going to discuss today is we are going to explore about the five key areas of cancer screening specifically today bowel breast cervical lung and prostate cancers these cancers represent some of the most uh, important tools which is going to which is going to discuss mainly in reducing the cancer rates as well as for better health outcomes today's session is aimed to provide for us in depth understanding of these programs that there are evidence based benefits and strategies to adopt to increase uptake in our communities i'm sure dr salim will be discussing about these things and what we have to do we have privilege to have with us uh, dr azim salim who will lead this session sharing valuable insights and addressing your questions i encourage everyone to actively participate they can ask questions in tamil after each cancer because we're discussing about five cancer screening so that it makes our discussions very productful thank you for taking your time to come for this webinar and i'll ask request azim salim to start this please thank you thanks sajibal i'm going to share my screen i just want to see if you can see the screen first uh Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. 
Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, and uh, Asalaamu Alaikum to everyone and good morning. Um, my name is Azeeb Saleem and it's um, kind of introduced by Ajmal, Saleem Ajmal. So we, we go, we, we, we both qualified at very similar time. Ajmal was a year young, young junior to me. He studied at MMC, I studied at Kilpok Medical College. So also our names, the way we are in South India, we are very patronymic names, aren't we? So we, our father's name go before our names, not all, but my father's name is Azim and I'm Salim and same with Ajmal, his father's name was Salim, who was our, um, who was our head, head of department in third unit in KMC. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction on what um, screening is and then go through these five uh, screening uh, five cancer types and uh, there are screening has got pros and cons something which uh, you need to realize there are subtle nuances to it which you need to need to uh, need to need to sort of take into consideration but overall the general view is that screening is generally helpful and it's, it helps in prevent in, in diagnosing early cancer so what i'm going to do is uh, split the talk into uh, sort of two two main areas one is give a brief background on what it is then give a pause for you to ask questions and then uh, discuss screening for cancer in, in specific areas which which we have so the first three areas the screening programs are already running the fourth area lung it is starting and the fifth area is still a bit controversial should i say uh, because there are pros and cons on prostate cancer so the big message is this is a modeling figure, really. What they found is as people live longer and as we get control of our heart attacks and other diseases or make those diseases into chronic diseases, allow the diseases, or the, you, you don't cure them, but you control them for a long period of time. So if you can control a disease for 70 years and you're only going to live for eight years, that's as good as not cure, but as good as having a lifetime without any problem with the disease. So that's a good thing. So what they what they what they estimate is somebody who's born in 1960 in the UK, one in two percent will have lifetime risk of cancer. So if someone's born in once and you can see that curve is increasing really as the incidence goes up. So they model it and say, See, if someone born in 1960, the chances of them in getting cancer is one in two. So every 50% chance, so every two, one in two percent will get cancer. So that's the amount of cancer risk we get. That's because purely because we live longer and we are controlling other diseases, the risk of cancer keeps to increase. The other disease which they predict will keep increasing as we live longer is dementia. So we will have some so chance of having cancer and forgetting we have cancer is very high because we'll also forget we have cancer if we get dementia. So what is cancer screening? Screening is not diagnosis. It is looking at healthy people, apparently healthy. So somebody is not having any problems. You do not have any problems. You do not have any lumps, bumps anywhere. You have no symptoms. And that is what screening is. Doing a test in people who are apparently healthy. It's not a substitute for diagnosis or you have symptoms. So if you have symptoms, if you're coughing up blood, having cough, but not passing urine, go to the GP. Don't wait for screening. If you have, if you're apparently not, if you're apparently normal, you will be cost for screening to see if you have cancer. Why? Because you, when you pick up a disease early, you can cure it potentially. And curing and, and treating a disease in the early stage is easier. Say, for example, it's confined to one area. You can either chop it and throw it away or treat it. Once it spreads to different parts of the body, it becomes difficult to cure. It's more a question of controlling things. So that's the whole rationale for screening. Screening is picking up disease early and treating it early. There are certain things with screening. A screening test is not... It's a simple test, but it's not a totally accurate test. You can do a screening test. It doesn't mean that test will definitely tell you whether you have cancer or don't have cancer. So you have certain um, issues with screening tests. So you have something called, you'll use, they'll use terms such as specificity and sensitivity in medical terminology. I've just broken that into simple things as false positive and false negative. False, what's false positive? <clears throat> So you have you have go to a screening one goes to a screening test and they say ah your screening test is positive. That doesn't mean that person has cancer. 
some of these tests are positive, but they don't have cancer. So they need to have further tests. It's a first pass mechanism to see whether there are indications of cancer. And if there is nothing to show it is you, ha you have further tests and there is no cancer. So people have false positive tests. The only issue with false positive tests, it creates a psychological burden in tests. So, so supposing you go to a screening test and they say your mammogram is positive, come for more tests. You immediately start worrying, oh, have I got cancer? What is it? I'm worried. It's mentally, psychologically, it's stressful. But what you need to realize is it doesn't mean that you have cancer. It is something to clarify whether you have cancer or not. And the same thing, there is a false negative test, i.e. you have test is negative, but it doesn't mean that you have cancer. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have cancer. So it can be a negative test. So you cannot say, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine for the next to the next screening test in three years' time. Let me go enjoy life. Let me go 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 to the world or something. But if you have you, you can enjoy the world, do whatever you want. But if you have any symptoms in between, and I'll come to that when in questions when we go to breast cancer, go and see the GP. Don't neglect your no don't neglect things. Go and see your GP. So that's a false diagnosis. The third important thing is overdiagnosis, and this is a controversy, not a controversy, an area of much discussion in the medical world about overdiagnosis. So there are cancers which will not do you any harm during your lifetime. The question is, why do you treat this cancer? Say they, they've looked at prostate cancer patients in their 80s who, they di who died, and they did post-mortem on these patients, and they found that about 30% or 40% of people had prostate cancer. The prostate cancer did not kill them. They've died because of other reasons. So in a few, in a small number of patients who are old, people get cancer because the cells become, uh, lose control, they multiply, et cetera, but it doesn't harm. So you end up treating a small number of people who do not, who have cancers, but those cancers will not cause you harm. So for example, if somebody has got a, a cancer, which is going to 70 years old, and cancer is going to cause problem in 30 years or 30 years time. There's no point treating them, but because that person is unlikely to live for 100 years. They may do, but we don't know. So this is the area where the policymakers need to make a decision whether the screening test is right for that population. Because if you do overdiagnosis and you don't get any benefit, all you do is you find a cancer, you put a patient saying you got cancer, but the cancer is not creating harm. So you really need to look at the benefits and risk, really. What is the benefit and what is the risk? And this is the, something which the governments take into consideration, the policymakers take into consideration, really. And um, there are different types of screening tests. One is a population screening. So you include all people of the general population or the sex and age and sex determined like cervix, bowel and breast. So you can't, you don't do a breast screening in males. You do not do a cervix screening in males. Bowel cancer you do in both or a certain age population. That's the population screen. The targeted screening is you take these into consideration, but you add a few more consideration like lung cancer screening, they target for patients who smoke or ex-smokers. So that is targeted screening. So these are the two types of screening which which, which, which are broadly, uh, how the screening is divided. So the reason for this webinar and the importance of screening uptake is generally, and this is a slide I borrowed from the BIMA, uh, where they say that screening is generally less amongst, uptake is less amongst Muslims. And uh, Ajmal kindly went through all those factors which may be lowering the thing. Um, if you look at the areas of embarrassment and invasive procedures, yes, breast cancer screening is an X-ray can be invasive. Cervical cancer is a bit invasive. You need to have speculum. There is a 20 to 30% drop. But what is really interesting is even among bowel cancer screening, which is not an invasive procedure, really. Uh, there's a 40% lower uptake among Muslims compared to the national average. So it's really it's really something which um, people we need to look into why this is happening. There are various reasons. And uh, there is actually a Cancer UK funded program, which is funded by, which is running in University of Glasgow and Sunderland, where there is a special program to reach out to Muslims to improve the screening amongst Muslim. And there are organizations like the BMIA, which are promoting screening procedures. So I think I'll stop there for some questions before we proceed, if we have any questions. 
or um, if you if you want, I'm happy to speak in Tamil if you want. But if you want me to carry on in English as well, I can do it. Uh, uh, which 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 whichever you prefer. Any questions? Thank you, um, uh, Salim. It was very good, actually. I mean, I've given a overview. Uh, because being on the other side, being a general practitioner, I can completely understand what it is. But I think the most important is the number no, Muslims. Muslims, when they, the uptake is very poor. And Allah, we have to think how to do and how what best to be done. Yeah. I think so. That's what we have got an organization. So most probably end of the meeting, they have to discuss and see what how best we can uh, do ahead with it. Okay. Maybe if we start going with uh, this thing, if they have, there's no questions. Is that okay? We have in my archive if it is not that we'll go ahead with our. Uh, there's a question. There's a question for you, uh, saying what's the root cause that Muslims shy away from screening. Uh, uh, so I think Ajmal has already alluded to it. I, I think there are various so causes. First, you yeah. yeah. Uh, first one there, I have another mentioned one. It nanga. See one one the because uh, we can go go through that again. I think the most important thing is uh, they feel one one the language barrier because they don't know what it is and uh, I don't know whether you came in the beginning of the beginning of the talk uh, because sometimes actually there are misconceptions it won't happen to me or reluctance or they believe that um, or they have some negative experience in the past so maybe we'll have to see how or what best we can do that um, and someone wanted the slide yes we can I mean it's depend upon uh, Azim I mean if you want to we can I'm, I'm happy slide. to share I'm happy to share the slides yeah uh, I think there's no copyrighted image in it, so yeah, I yeah, sure. So I think somebody said they prefer to speak in Eng English. They said, yes. that, uh, okay. But if there's, if you English want, and... yeah, we can always uh, change over. Yeah, that's fine. We can always uh, this thing. Okay, if you can go ahead, yeah. Then we can have. We'll give them once. Let us finish the this thing, and we'll have yeah. a chat with them. Yeah. How to go ahead with it? So, so I'm going to bowel cancer. Uh, bowel cancer is. In Tamil is kodal, periacodal. The, the, the first is the sirukodal, then you have the big kodal. I've put those two images side to side so that you can have the English version and the Tamil version. So there are certain new words in Tamil I only learned today when I looked at the Google Maps to see the translation. There is ascending colon, which is erumuha kodal. Then there is transverse colon, which is kurigya kodal. Then there is descending colon, irangamuha kodal. And then there is Nelivu coral, which is sigmoid, and there is malak coral, which is rectum. This is where it screens. It doesn't screen for cancer in the small bowel. It screens for cancer in the large bowel, although you can still pick up things. But cancer in the small bowel is generally rare. Uh, it's mainly the cancer in the large bowel, which is in the colonic area, which is high. So just going through the symptoms before we go through screening. So what do you get when you get bowel cancer? You get tiredness and breathlessness. So unlike cancers of the head, where if you have a tumor in the head, it expands and then you get a headache or fits or whatever. Bowel cancer, even if you have a lump in the bowel, it doesn't, there's a lot of place to expand. Our tummies do not, are not in a rib cage or whatever you can expand. So what actually happens when you have bowel cancer is you tend to have tiny bleeding. And that bleeding can cause edema, breathlessness, tiredness, etc. And then because it's if because of blood, if the blood is coming from lower down, it is bright red. But if it's coming from higher up, it gets digested. And it becomes like tar, like tar they put in the road. It becomes black tarry stools. So if one has black tarry stools, tiredness, breathlessness, or uh, blood in the motion or change in bowel habit, see the GP. Don't wait for screening. You, 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 you need to see the GP and you need to sort of find out what it is. And then slide. Uh, and then there are risk factors for cancer. Uh, I mean, I, I, I the, well, sorry, I skipped the f first slide. Bowel cancer incidence is much higher in the UK compared to the India. And, and if you look at the UK incidence, it is 27 per 100,000. In India, it's only 4 per 100,000. And when I was in India practicing, there's very little bowel cancers I used to see. But as here in the UK, bowel cancer is very common. And a lot of it is they attribute to the too much of processed meat and high high fat diet um, uh, and not enough fruits and vegetables. I know we want to have biryani, we don't eat fruit and vegetables, but eat fruit and vegetables. Biryani is good, meat is good, but fruits and vegetables are good as well. So try to have a balanced diet. 
And obesity is very important, really. Obesity and cancer theme comes up all the time. There is a lot of obesity relationship to cancer. And this is a problem we see among South Asians. And we see because of various reasons, uh, we are busy with families. We don't have time to do exercise. We don't go for a walk. We tend to be slightly on the overweight side. And I think historically, when you're in India, when you're and if you're thin, they think in the in a tibia, in a tibia, they say. So we want to be a bit on the obese side, really. So obesity, you need to really manage obesity, really. You need to control weight. Smoking is a risk factor, and I hope alcohol probably is not a risk factor for Muslims, but again, there's something. And there's also some genetic syndromes which are associated with bowel cancer, inflammatory bowel disease. In the UK, what you can see here is on the on the left hand side, you can see a plot of um, uh, where, where the um, uh, when we do the screening on the on the top left, that 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 bar is where the screening is done. And in the UK, there are four countries: uh, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And each country follows their own rules on when they do screening. And in in UK, the screening for bowel cancer starts between fifty four starts at fifty four and seventy four. Uh, many years ago, it used to be sixty. It used to start, and they slightly started moving it to bring it to fifty. In the US, the screening starts at fifty. Uh, so what um, and and in the, and uh, as you can see in the slide, there are different uh, age groups which they screen at different slides. So if, as you can see on the on the graph on the right hand side, the incidence key, the number of cases increasing, and this is the incidence rate. This is the rate per hundred thousand. So as you grow older, the, because of, there are less number of people alive at that age, the in, actually incident rate drops, but the cases keep uh, are increasing up to a certain age. So what, how do they do screening tests? So if you are registered with a GP and you're within that age group in the country you live, you will get a kit. This will arrive by post. It's called the bowel scan kit, which will arrive by post. And it will say it's a green colored bag. Uh, I don't know if its color is different in Scotland or whatever. In England, it's a green colored bag and with a sample with instructions how to take a motion. The malam. You have to take your malam and put it up. Take some uh, st stool sample. They'll give you instructions. Don't it should not be wet with urine or something. And then you need to take a bit of sample, put in the bag, write your name, uh, take the time you've taken and post it. That's it. So that's why it's not an invasive procedure at all. But even in this, there is uptake among Muslim men that's 40 percent less. So this is the curious thing. Uh, I think uh, Syed Basha asked the question about why is it less? So it, it is ununderstandable, really, why why we do not want to even do a simple post, because uh, I think it's a pre-post thing. You don't even need to put a postage stamp, so it's all free. So all you need to take is a motion, put it in, and what you need to uh, and you need to send it off. They will analyze it, and if there is uh, what they will look at is for blood, because you can't always see blood with your naked eye. They look under with a fecal uh, immunohistochemical test, fecal immunohemoglobin test, a fit testing, and if it's over a certain level, then you they, they will call you for colonoscopy. For colonoscopy, what it means is they will put a small tube through your back passage, and like a camera, they will look to see if you have any. Uh, polyps or growth or whatever. A small thing, they will take it off straight away and send it off for biopsy or so, whatever. If not, they will say, you come back, you do this, go on the screening again. So that is the first step. If you have any blood, then you go to the hospital or whatever. Now, they also have something called a, a, a CT colonoscopy, where they don't even need to put a tube through your back passage. All they'll do is a CT scan, reconstruct the images and see the see what's inside. So it's a fairly simple test, and I don't think if we get, I, I, I think you, if you get this, please do send it. It's a very easy, simple test. Don't miss it. Most important, if you have symptoms, go to the GP. But if the screening test arrives, please do it. And whoever, your neighbors, friends, or whatever, if the screening test, don't put it because the post goes, okay, I'm too tired. I can't be bothered. Oh, I lost it somewhere. If you lose it, you can rig them up and ask them again. But uh, please do it. These kits are also available by your GP. And I think I'm sure Ajmal, uh, uh, Ajmal dispenses these kits because GPs actually give these, uh, get these tests done as well. So um, get it done. And, um, and, and it's a simple test. It's not a problem at all. Um, and, 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 and you can have investigation. If you want to go and see a GP for the problem, it's usually you have some, uh, they, they will do test, but screening is also very important. 
So I think with that, I'll stop with ball cancer and ask, uh, leave for any questions, really. Sure. I'll start off with a question, uh, Azima. Plus, I just want to say, as in my experience as a GP, uh, unfortunately, the GPs are very busy. So that, that's where the problem is. Because it's a national screening program, the uh, post letters, everything come, goes directly to the patient. And once the patients have a negative sample, they send only a sample. I mean, they send the results to us stating that it's negative. And they say, and they also write to us the patients who have not responded. Okay. I came aware of this thing was when the CQC came for a visit, they said, doctor, your colonic cancer is very poor. Only then I realized that my patients are not doing it. See, uh, they, see they don't understand the importance of it. So that's the reason why uh, now I have asked my staffs to actually to call and remind them that the importance of the bowel cancer screening and how important to detect the cancer early. That is one thing. Second thing I wanted to mention was even because we are discussing about bowel, I thought we'll just finish each each uh, cancer on its own before we proceed to the next one. Even though you have the screening, even though it's done, if someone has got family history of bowel cancer, it is very, very important for you to come and let your GP know that you've got a history of bowel cancer. So then you will be speeded up and if someone was asking about the age, they will start to at 50 or even earlier and they have regular uh, regular colonoscopy or they do regular fit test okay recently the nice have also informed us that the most important is these symptoms if someone is having any altered bowels if they have any uh, pain if they have any anemia it is important to repeat the fit test i mean he was talking about the fit test which is a test which is done by the gps even if it is younger age even if you're 30 40 if you have if you pass any blood in your uh, stool um, make sure that they do at least a basic test like hemoglobin, which all, which all can be done. So we don't want to miss it. Earlier we detected it is completely curable. That's what we are trying to insist on the screening procedures. Uh, is, does anyone else want to ask any questions pertaining to this bowel cancer? Then we can go ahead with the next one. Okay. Shall we go on to the next one? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think I think I I I wasn't sure that the they contact the GP if this uptake has been poor, which is actually a very good good thing because uh, the GPs can remind the patients as well about uh, or not patients, uh, the specific people about who has hasn't answered really. Yeah, yeah. And and going back to your question about the um, familial history, I I didn't go in deep into it. They generally. Correct. Uh, it's 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 a sort of there are certain syndromes like the familiar um, familial adeno FAP syndrome familial adenosis polyposis and the Lynch syndrome which is the sure. hereditary uh, sort of non non polyposis cancer syndrome. These people need screening at a much younger age, and there's a Correct. and these are sort of some of these uh, syndromes are autosomally dominant uh, inherited, so you have to be really really on 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 screening. So it's very important that they inform the GP really because if the GP right. doesn't know, it's very difficult. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was insisting. Yeah. Thank Excuse you. Me. Sorry. I had posted a couple of questions in the chat window. Do you want me to repeat them? Uh, I didn't yeah, see them. Ahead. Yeah. Um, so if we, for bowel can cancer itself, if we do the home screening test, is that adequate or the, to start off with at least? That's one question. The second one is how often do we need to repeat the uh, home screening? So I think if you... Um... I don't, uh, it's, I can't, I think it's done every two years. So yeah, once you have two years, yeah, yeah, that's what it's done. Um, it's done every two years, but does not mean that, see, that's what I was trying to uh, highlight the factor that even though it is two years, if you have any symptoms, it has to be done. Any tests, like even though you've done the, even if, for example, if you've done the fit screening, you've done the bubble screening, it's come back as negative. Next day you develop, um, you're passing blood in your stools, or you're having some altered bowels, you have some pain abdomen, hemoglobin is low, still it has to be investigated. That is the importance of it. Even though this, this is only a screening procedure, it is not like diagnosis. And especially if you have a family history, it's important that they usually, the I, mean, I think oncologists know from, as far as I know, I think so they usually scan every year. And once every year it's normal, then they push on to five years. But I think so if you, the most important is the symptoms, any loss of weight, he was also mentioning about black thirty stools and all that. So that is what is very important to trigger for bowel cancers. 
Shanmila, the most important thing is screening tests are not an answer to diagnosis. It is just Correct. a test. It's a, it's a simple test. It's not 100% accurate. But if you have symptoms, even though your fit test is negative, if you have symptoms, etc., okay. really, yes. you need to see your GP. Do not rely on screening tests as an answer to your problems. Correct. I would like to insist on that, please. I mean, whoever is listening to that and to go back to the family, even though the screening tests are negative, it is false reassurance. If you have symptoms, please go and see your GP. I will, I'll come back to breast okay. cancer. But breast cancer, they do screening every three years. But what they, and it'll come in the slide when I'm discussing breast, and they 15 to 40 percent of cancers are detected between screening. So somebody has screening, and their next screening is only three years' time. But what they see is about, 50, about 40 percent, up to 40 percent of patients can develop cancer between screening. So it means nothing. It, mean, it means a lot. I'm not saying I don't want to dismiss screening. You can pick up something there, but you it, tumors can go quicker. Two year, cancers do not wait for two years. If somebody has a problem, it can grow in six months, three months. So it's just, just if it's just an approximation based on what evidence is really to say that they screen every two years. So sure. if you have symptoms, see your GP. Okay. Shall we go to the next one? Uh, yeah. Where you have the timing of? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. So, so this is breast cancer again. Is the most common cancer in the UK. Uh, what you should realize is it or can also affect men. And then uh, it's a small number, but it can still affect men. The incidence in UK is a lot higher. There are a certain sort of associations of breast cancer and of overweight and obesity is a big a area which comes into play. So is alcohol. Um, so is alcohol. And then, um, uh, and then uh, there's a small protective benefit of uh, breastfeeding, they say uh, five percent is not breastfeeding. So ninety, uh, and then the the risk association with o, o, HRT and o, contraceptive pill, and again the breast cancer. There is also a genetic uh, background with there's something called the BRCA one and two mutations, which is affects certain racial uh, communities like the Ashkenazi Jews seem to have high preponderance of BRCA one and two mutations. Uh, and there's a family history is also very strong. If you have a strong family history, breast cancer is, is, uh, is something you need to be aware of, really. And a lot of patients, when you go to a breast cancer clinic, if you have, if somebody has breast cancer and you have a family history of breast cancer, they, they tend to do genetic testing for pa patients as well. Uh, and then uh, the, the other usual thing about obesity, alcohol as, as well is breast cancer. I'm sorry, I'm just rushing a bit because um, of, of the time really, but you, the, it's all there on the slides. So what, what are the symptoms of breast cancer? It's usually a lump. So mainly women discover lump. They say, we have a shower and we found a lump on my breast. And usually it's uh, uh, on one of the four quadrants, which is the four breast is divided into four parts, and and then they go to the GP really, but that they can be skin changes. The nipple goes inside. Usually the nipple is pointing outside. Sometimes the nipple goes inside. That's also an indication of breast cancer, and you can get a lump in the armpit, or you can have an ulcer in the breast. They usually go to the GP, and the GPs do a two week referral. So if you have a suspected cancer, they have something called a two week pathway. So as soon as they refer the hospital has to see them within two weeks. They are generally referred in a two-week pathway. This is what happens to breast cancer. So if you have symptoms and your GP suspects, you will be seen quite quickly in the doctor. The hospitals are obliged to see a GP referral within two weeks. And there's a 3162 pathway as well. We need to treat quite quickly. So when is breast scanning screen done? Again, you can see the plot here with the incidence rates and, and the breast scanning screening is done between 50 and 70 years. And, and if you're registered GP, you're invited for a mammogram. A mammogram is like an X-ray. So you go there, they do an X-ray of both your breasts, two views, side views, and top to bottom views. Generally, people say it's a, it's, it's a, bit, of, it's a bit painful, but it's okay. When you, X, when you do X-rays, they squeeze your breast a bit. Excuse me. There's also a worry about radiation exposure in some people, but I, all I wanted to tell you is the radiation exposure isn't a huge amount. So if you live in the UK, you're exposed to a certain amount of radiation, about 2.5 to 3 millisievert where you live. There are areas like Aberdeen where you have, or Plymouth where you have a higher radiation. But what you see is it's like seven weeks of background radiation. Um, uh, when you fly across, uh, when you do a, a, a international flight, again you're exposed to radiation. So it's not a huge amount of radiation. So 
worry about radiation should not put you off having a, 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 a test for breast cancer, a screening. So the area of breast cancer, as I said, uh, you can see in the third bullet point, that 20 to 40 percent of cancers occur between mammograms and women are falsely reassured. So they, a lot of people go to a breast screening, it's negative and they think it's all normal. So it is normal at that point of time, but you can always have an uh, issue immediately the day after or a week after or a month after. So if one finds a lump between those three years time, go and see your GP and, and it's a rapid referral. And once you come to a hospital, they do three tests. They do an ultrasound, they do a mammogram. And if there's a lump, they do a something called, they'll put a needle and take a biopsy out of the breast. This is the triple test, which is done in, uh, in, uh, in hospitals as soon as the patient's referred. So in terms of screening, this, this, you can see the, you can see the uh, plot on the, on the, on the right side where they say, for uh, and it, this has been a controversy whether the, in, in the 80s and 90s there were a lot of articles in the Lancet where they said is breast screening worthwhile at all. So what they said is there's a all you're doing is you're detecting cancer early, but you're not actually saving lives. So they they have done some studies and what they found is for every thousand patients screened, uh, five lives can be saved with screening. But it also the flip side is that 17 patients. Um, uh, will be overdiagnosed, i.e. these patients will have treatment for breast cancer and the breast cancer would not cause harm for them during their lifetime. So this is for the every five patients' lives you save, you end up treating 17 patients out of 1,000 patients with overdiagnosis. It's 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 a matter of fact. So and it depends from country to country. So some countries, war-torn countries, may think five lives, five women's lives saved is not a big big enough money. We may put the money to somewhere else, and they don't do breast screening. But for the UK, they think those five lives saved also is 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 very important. So breast screening program is a part of the national screening program in the UK and most of the Western countries because the policymakers think breast screening is very important. So although 17 persons may be overdiagnosed and overtreated, unnecessarily you could argue, but the number of lives saved is still substantial. Uh, so that is where the breast scanning screening is. You will be uh, asked to come for breast scanning regularly. And, and this is the area of... Uh, some amount of area where they were discussing about overdiagnosis and false positive. And I, I, I didn't mention this. So in the previous slide, you can see for every 100 patients they treat, four patients will need more tests. So out of those four patients, three patients will not have breast cancer. Only one will have breast cancer. So again, this is an area. So if somebody has a screening test, screening, and then they actually are found to find on mammogram, you can be 75% of them will not have breast cancer. Only one would have breast cancer. So this is where the false positives and the overdiagnosis comes. So um, there is a there may be a sense among Asians to say breast cancer is not common among Asians. We breastfed our children. We are not obese. We have a different lifestyle. It may not affect. Breast cancer affects Asians a lot as well. I have seen a number of Asian patients, both in India and here, having breast cancer. Um, there is um, the Chinese thing um, that uh, milk, uh, if you don't take milk, you don't get breast cancer, but even they get breast cancer. There is a lot of talk about um, not screening because of the overdiagnosis, but on balance, screening is a good thing to do. And uh, to reassure you, all my family members have had screening for breast cancer. So this is something I don't, I, I would strongly recommend if you can get done. So I think with that, I will stop on breast cancer and uh, leave for some questions. This is a, this is a, is a topic. Thank you, um, Salim. One thing I want as a GP, I would want to say is, even though they always say like breast, we have to have a lump and all that, but now they're more focused on breast awareness. So I definitely recommend all the women to check their breast. And if they feel something is abnormal, not right, then to go. Because right, like rightly, um, Salim was mentioning that immediately they do an, they do an ultrasound mammogram and uh, they do the biopsy if needed. So if they feel something is not right, always go and see a GP. Don't take it for granted. Has anyone got any other questions? Then we can go on with the next one. Yeah. Um, so we just have another question on the chat saying, why do we hear more cases of breast cancer lately compared to 10 years ago? 
Um, I think that's. Uh, I think that, that there are two things. Once you start screening, you will pick up more breast cancer cases. And I said seventeen percent is overdiagnosis. Uh, and then I think the lifestyle also changes. There's an increasing relationship between obesity and breast cancer. So I think there is uh, that relationship with obesity is still there. Uh, so if the more people are putting on weight and having uh, having uh, develop obesity, there is breast cancer there. But uh, to ask that big question, why are you seeing more? I don't know, because if you look at the full population curve, which I put in the slide number two, the overall incidence of cancer is going up throughout. Uh, and as we live longer, we get more cancers, et cetera, really, whether that is the influence of increased radiation or what we eat or what we drink, that is something which is really difficult to identify because you need many millions of patients for such epidemiological studies to come to a conclusion. And then we just have another question. Can you uh, go through briefly on the unnecessary treatment in overdiagnosed population? So what happens is um, people who are postmenopausal, you know, people who, who are women in their 70s, uh, 60s and late 70s, the screening, the screening goes to the age of 70 years. So if somebody has breast cancer when they're 68 or 69, they have tiny tumors, and they are uh, probably will not grow, will not, will be sitting there doing nothing for about 20, 25 years. Uh, in which case you end up treating them, uh, which may be, which may not, which may not make a difference. If this patient has got a bad heart disease and has got a stroke or something, then they have a breast cancer, which is tiny. They may die of, bre they may die of uh, cardiac issues in two or three years time, and the breast cancer will only kill them in five or eight or 10 years time. So that is over treatment, really over diagnosis, over treatment. And when they come to, when they come to hospitals also, we also as clinicians, we make decisions really. If somebody, we go by something called a performance status. If somebody's performance status is poor they are not they are lying in bed for 50 percent of the day we do not treat patients generally we say even the cancer page treatment you give uh, is not going to be overall beneficial because your other diseases will kill you before cancer does so these are these are judgments one has to make clinically but there is no crystal ball to say which are the patients which should not be treated or not uh, the in, the instinctual feeling is once you have breast cancer you go through the pathway if only i know this patient will not need treatment i will not treat but i don't know nobody can tell you that that's a very difficult thing to answer I don't know if I answered that question. Was was that okay enough, or do you need I think more? He's given a thumbs up, so I think okay, doesn't happy. We have a, do you have a time for another one more question? Sure. Um, so increase of cancer, particularly in women. What might be the reason? Um, in spite of healthy weight and good lifestyle. Again, it's relating back to the to the uh, uh, previous question. Really, it's a question of. What is there in your food? What is there in it? There was a theory where they're saying people are having a lot of oral contraceptive pill. If you look at the water supply, there's a lot of hormones and the hormones are triggering it. I mean, a lot of these things may be true, but they also border on conspiracies really. So really difficult to make out unless there's a clear relationship. It is really difficult. But what I can say is probably multiple factors, really. It's and I and I, I I don't know the answer for that. If only I knew, I would not be here. So I think there are multiple factors. It's not one single factor which you can say that is a relationship for the uh, increased risk of cancer. But whether it's increasing in women compared to men, I don't know. For example, in lung, there are certain cancers which are not related to smoking, which is more predominant in women. It depends on the type of the cancer. Say, for example, you cure some ca curable cancers, the non-curable cancers, the incidence rises. So, so it's 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 a complex area, and to it's a jigsaw. It's difficult to piece one one thing together, one, one point to one thing. Thank you, um, Salim. If you can go to the next uh, screening, please. Yeah. So this is cervical cancer. So this is an area which, um, which um, this is type of cancer. Um, again, I put the pictures in both English and, and Tamil, Tamil, Tamil. In Tamil, it is karupai uh, vaipakudi. Uh, that is the whole uterus, is the mouth of the uterus, which is the cervix, and that part where, 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 where which, which sits at the entrance of the cervix, really. Unlike 
um, breast cancer and bowel cancer. This is more common in India. We see a lot of breast uh, cervical. We see a lot of cervical cancer in India compared to here, and it tends to occur in people who are um, uh, starting at a very young age. Um, and the main symptoms are vaginal bleeding during or after sex uh, or after menopause, uh, pain during sex or uh, or vaginal discharge. The risk factors is something called, a, it's a virus, it's a risk factor, one of the main risk factors is a virus called the human papilloma virus. <clears throat> and it can cause infections anywhere, it can cause infections, uh, it can cause cancers in your in your uh, cervix, head and neck, uh, anal, anus, etc. Really, there's also a, a weakened immune system also plays a, plays a role in it, <clears throat> besides sexual history and, and hormones. So the human papilloma virus is a sexually transmitted virus. It is transmitted through sex, but um, about 80% of women tend to get it. Uh, but everyone doesn't get cervical cancer. Uh, it's only people with weak immune system tend to get cervical cancer. And some women are unable to get it of them. So although it's a sexually transmitted virus, cervical cancer is not considered as a sexually transmitted disease. The immune system also plays a big role. So if someone has got HIV and they've got cervical cancer, then you classify them as AIDS. So you can have HIV without AIDS, but once they have HIV infection and cervical cancer, they become an AIDS patient. So uh, human papilloma virus plays a key role. There is a lot of evidence, or there is some evidence uh, from some uh, Danish study and other studies where they say the male circumcision has a protective roles and, and uh, genital, genital hygiene, especially the penile genital hygiene has a protective role. So uh, like we do wash ourselves and, um, and, and, and most Muslims tend to be circumcised, that has a protective role, but it is not an absolute protective role. It, it doesn't prevent cervical cancer, but it's, it's, it's something uh, which you ought to know. Uh, as you know, most Muslim countries also have cervical cancer. It doesn't mean that there's no cervical cancer, but it's known to have a protective role. And the important thing is one is screening, the other one is prevention. There is a vaccine available against this virus. Just like COVID vaccine is there is a vaccine against the human papilloma virus, which is available to all school going children age between 12 um, to 13 in school year eight. And if you if your children have missed it, they can still have, uh, if they are girls, they can have vaccines till they are um, 25 years. And boys after 1st of September 2006 can also have, because human papilloma virus not only prevents cervical cancer, but it also plays a big role in other types of cancers. So this is how screening is done. So um, screening is done, it starts at a relatively young age at 25 years to 49 years uh, and goes up to 49 years. And in Scotland, it's uh, slightly different. Uh, so essentially, this is mainly done by GP or other clinics, really. There are sort of family health clinics where patients go. They put a small speculum inside your vagina, take a smear from the cervix, cervix which is at the top end of the vagina, and they send it off for analysis where they look for the um, HPV 16 and 18 subtypes. And if they see abnormal cells, they call for colposcopy. Colposcopy is they put a camera inside your vagina to see if there are areas which are uncertain and take biopsies. And then if everything is normal, you go back to routine screening. If there is something abnormal, then they, they have further tests. So cervical cancer, one thing is don't be reassured saying we are, have good gentle hygiene, we are, we are all, all had sunnat kalyanam, so it's all fine. So uh, it's something you need to worry about, uh, 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 not worry about, to be careful about. So don't ignore it. Don't ignore your mail. I think that's it. Only one thing I want to mention here, even though the people, same thing has with other cancers, in case they have any symptoms between screening, it is very important, even though they say three years, five years, they can always go see their GP and have a smear done in case it happens in between. And one more thing I want to say to the youngsters is because they've started giving vaccinations, because you're vaccinated does not mean you will not get the cancer. So even if you have the vaccines, it is very important for people to still have the cervical screening um, uh, as and when they get the invitation letters. So not to avoid it because they've had the vaccinations. Correct. Thank you. Any, yeah. any, thank you. Any questions on this? I think someone answered, like, if there is any kind of genetic testing that can be done to, to lack of any family history of cancer, is there anything? I think it's a general question. I think so. If someone is adopted, if they don't, if they're not aware of their family history. 
If they, I mean, generally when you send for genetics testing, I think there are certain places to do genetic testing. They generally ask for a family history, but if even if you have a close relative who is, say, for example, if you have cancers below the in the family who are who are less than fifty years old, then they they are it. And and there are certain syndromes who are associated. For example, sorry, no, I think so. No, uh, Salim, they, what they want is in case they are adopted, if they don't know their or the, they have, I mean, the parents die very early age or they don't have any family history, what happens then? Uh, I don't know. Have a family history. I don't know because they generally need a family history unless they test the genetic testing. They don't do a genetic testing is not on demand really because this no. is something they do, they 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 Correct, check yeah. your, take your history to do yeah. it really. I think that's what is very important for yeah. them to have these. I mean, these all these red flag symptoms and it's very important for them to carry out all the screening procedures as an age because I think that's what is very important. Okay, shall we go? We got two more yeah. to go. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is targeted screening with lung cancer. Again, lung cancer is uh, is quite common in the U.S. There are some of the rates for the smoking-related cancer is dropping, but the related for non-smoking-related lung cancer is happening. So although smoking is thing, it can happen in non-smokers as well. Main thing is coughing or blood shortness of breath with lung cancer. And you can see here that is the bit of lung, that the lungs there, and there's a cancer on the top right there, which is a bright spot. Uh, again, air pollution. So what's happening in the UK is they are opening up this targeted population screening to different parts of the UK. And they are, and as you can see in the maps, the, 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 the footprint of lungs targeted lung scanning is increasing. They usually do a, a, so basically they get the details from the GP uh, in the area where they're screening and they screen anyone who's an ex-smoker or a current smoker aged between 55 and 64. They do a telephone call, ask some questions, do a triage, then ask them to come to have a low-dose CT scan. These are like big, big lorries or big uh, trucks for just standing in a Sainsbury's or Tesco supermarket. You go there, have a CT, low-dose CT scan. And if the CT scan shows something, then according to what they say, they are either referred to a hospital straight away or they go on the screening pathway repeatedly. Again, the same issue of um, uh, sort of false positives are there. Some screening is there and carries on. Uh, uh, if they have, if you don't have anything, you carry on uh, on the screening. And again, like any cancer, if you have any symptoms, see your GP. Most importantly, don't smoke and no shisha. Shisha is the other thing which is catching up in the Muslim community. Shisha, again, is harmful. Don't smoke or don't do shisha. Only one thing I want to raise is this. In case someone coughs up blood, don't brush it aside. Please go and see your GP. And it's one of what we call as a red flag signs. The GP will immediately request for a chest X-ray. And they have got a process in GP surgeries where if something is abnormal, immediately you'll have a CT scan. So if anyone coughs up blood, Please go and see your GP. Don't miss it. That's very important. Thank you. All this we are saying about CGP, CGP, but getting a GP appointment is very difficult, Ajmal. <laughs> Not in my GP, actually. I'm sorry to say that, but I mean, but they say that they have coughed up blood. They will be able to see them. I mean, because that's what is important, isn't it? Can go ahead with the prostate cancer. Okay. So this is again an area where we do not do screening in the UK, but this is something for you to be more aware of. Prostate is a bit of a small piece of gland in 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 in, in men, which is situated below the bladder, and they and the incidence in UK is higher. And going back to one of the previous questions, why is the prostate cancer increasing? And it's increasing. They said about fifty percent in the last ten years because of a test, blood test called a PSA test, which stands for prostate-specific antigen. It's more common in uh, people of uh, Afro-Caribbean black origin compared to white and Asian. There's a strong family history, uh, father, brother, grandfather, there's a, a higher risk of getting prostate cancer. Uh, and again, the symptoms are Nocturia. So people, men want to pass urine very often. They get up too often to pass urine in the night. They hesitancy. They cannot start urine straight away. Or at the, at the end of urine, they start dribbling. These are the symptoms of prostate. But they can also happen other th uh, uh, other areas like the benign prostate hypertrophy. But these are the symptoms of prostate cancer, and that's the incidence rate on the right side. So. So the issue of prostate cancer is we do not do a screening test here because PSA is not definitive. So you people, people can have a 
high PSA in a benign condition, or people can have normal PSA and still have prostate cancer. It is not an end all really. So if you're worried, you need to see a GP and the GP will counsel you over the pros and cons of doing a PSA. They will put a finger through your back passage. And sometimes that is actually a very good examination if the GPs can do it. When, when GP trainees come, we tell them how to do a proper prostate exam. They roll through their finger throughout the whole prostate and they can actually see, pick up any nodules or whatever, that's a very good thing compared to a benign enlargement. And uh, then they refer to a hospital. And when you come to a hospital, the urologist goes through the same thing. They say, we need to do a biopsy or an MRI to actually diagnose it. We don't know whether it's prostate cancer or not. You need to have tests, uh, further tests done. So the issue of overdiagnosis here comes comes here really. So they have done a similar modeling studies by using prostate screening, using PSA. This is not MRI or biopsy or anything. So if you just use PSA as a screening mechanism, you what you can see here is 20%, 20 people are overdiagnosed and there is no life saved due to screening. So the argument in UK is that there is no advantage of PSA screening to the whole population, but based on your symptoms, you need to be investigated. So if you have any symptoms, go to your GP, PSA may be appropriate, but if you're not having symptoms or you don't have a family history or you're not having things, then there is no point, therefore there's no point in putting a screening program for the whole country. So it's a very, very symptomatic, symptom-driven diagnosis. PSA is valuable, uh, but, uh, but it is just not the only test which is necessary for uh, screening. Uh, it's just not a screening test. You need more tests. There's a lot of research going on to see more tests. They're trying to do some uh, short sequence uh, MRI sc scans as a screening test, like just they do for lung cancer, which may be a better than PSA test, or to combine two or three tests to come to a diagnosis for screening. So that's still work in progress progress for screening. In USA, they use PSA for screening. So there's a higher diagnosis of prostate cancer, and there's also a higher incidence of overdiagnosis. Uh, I think this is something Ajmal probably sees a lot more. Uh, prostate cancer occurs in people who are slightly um, elderly, post-retired, who have a lot of time. And a lot of them are substantially wealthy. They have a lot of money to spend as well. So they have more tests as well. They go, a lot of things is done privately. So I'll pass that on to Ajmal. He may need to add a few more points on prostate cancers. Yes, I mean, urology is my specialization. What I would like to only remind people is if they have any family history of prostate cancer, and if they are more than, there were some few questions, that if they are more than 40 years old, it is best to have your PSA done. Of course, there were other reasons why the PSA can go up as well, but at least it's an indication. Or if even if it's nothing, at least you have a baseline figure of PSA. But PA, people should also remember that PSA is not the only way of diagnosing prostate cancer because the PSA can still be normal and still you can detect uh, prostate cancer. So if you have a family history, it's best just to get it checked every year from your GP. GP will definitely agree with that. Um, I think so that, uh, is that, that this was the final. Uh... Yeah, yeah. I just got the summary here before we finish. So we're all at risk of getting uh, cancer uh, as we live longer. Uh, the best way to not to get cancer is to die when you're 30s or even 30s, you can get cancer. So if you want to live longer, we are all at risk of getting cancer. And inshallah, we all will live longer. We all should live longer. So um Prevention is better than cure. So there's no point getting cancer and then saying, oh, I've got early cancer or whatever. Lead a healthy lifestyle. Okay, maintain idle weight. I know there's a question from one of the persons saying, even though we live a healthy weight, let's say women are getting cancer. But that doesn't mean we need to leave a, lead, a, lead a rubbish uh, healthy weight. What would have happened if we led a, led a rubbish uh, life? We don't know. If we were all obese, we'll all be having cancer. And NHS will say we don't treat cancer anymore. So lead a healthy lifestyle. Might maintain ideal weight. I think the obesity is really important and we see this in a lot of Asians about obesity. We don't walk, we don't go to the gym, we like our food, we like our sort of Friday biryani really and we like to eat. I mean, and, and then um, we like to go by car more than walking If uh, and, and, and I think try to lose weight, no smoking or shisha. Uh, tell your children not to do shisha is not a substitute for smoking. Um, so very important we ask them um, not to smoke, not only in front of us, not only away from us as well, no smoking or shisha. 
try to vaccinate children with HPV vaccine if possible, if you can. If you missed it, there's nothing you can do. You can still vaccinate girls until a certain age. Early diagnosis enables cancer cure. It's a basic principle. If you pick up cancer early, we treat early, we get a cure early. But certain areas like prostate, there's overdiagnosis, there's no screening though. But in breast cancer, there's but you need that's something you need to balance. But overall, the benefits are good. Most important between screening, if you have symptoms, do not neglect screening. If one message if you can take home today is screening is very important, but symptoms between screening means that you still could have cancer do not neglect that is the most important if you take anything that is the message you take home go for screening but do not ignore symptoms that is all i can say seek medical advice if you have any some symptoms i think that is what it is uh, inshallah may all allah give us all long hayat and life and a happy life and uh, i wish you all the best thank you um Thank you, everyone. I mean, as we reach the end of this uh, seminar, I want to thank everyone for taking time to join us. Uh, we, in our discussion today, we highlighted how important it was the screening programs and to save lives and reduce the burden to, of course, to the healthcare systems. Uh, the knowledge shared by uh, Azim Salim is quite, uh, I mean, it's quite impressive and all the guidelines, benefits and the practical approaches. Uh, he gave us about talks about how to advocate and what to do for the screenings. As healthcare professionals, uh, it is very important for us and it's, we are responsible to look after our community. So what I will say is like, I mean, he did say about a take home message. My take home message will be for each of you, whoever has come here to go back home, to go back to your community. And you know that we've said like, for example, cervical cancer from 25 years of age, whether you have done it for, for example, bowel cancer, with your 50, make sure whether you have done it. Don't bin the letters which comes from the post. So it's very important that we share it and make sure that we don't miss it, especially uh, Bhima has said that our Muslim community is less and I think so a lot of other colleagues were worried about it as well, uh, why it's getting low. Uh, I did highlight a few factors, but once having listened to this, I think it's very important like each of you go back home and make sure your family, your relatives and your friends are screened and it's very important to do that. Um, and before... I close. Is there any specific burning questions? Because I know we have run about 10 minutes over time. Is there anything else you want to ask before we leave? Anyone can raise the hands? Okay. Um, uh, from uh, UKTM, uh, Asif, do you want to say anything or before we uh, close it? or? Um... Yeah, no, thank you. It's okay. Um, okay. Just, just my heartfelt thanks to you both for your valuable time and the wisdom. Inshallah, it's, we will take this message. I hope everyone takes this message and follow.